I do want to take a short departure uh, from the norm or from the usual and talk about a fairly specific thing that's um, maybe you would even say esoteric, but I think it needs to be done. It's a it's a useful study, something that I've come across here. Um, actually, I've seen it, I guess, but hadn't really delved into it uh, as deeply. And I think that this should be helpful. I th think that I've found things that are useful to us. So I want to look at unintentional, unintentional sins or honest deception, however you want to look at that. It is related, I guess, tangentially to the lesson about Eve's honesty. But unintentional sins are a thing that exist um, according to Hebrews chapter 9 and Hebrews chapter 10. For example, if it never caught your attention before, they're there. In Hebrews 9 verse 7, it is intimated to us that the high priest on the Day of Atonement must make a sacrificial offering for himself and he must make a sacrificial offering for the unintentional sins of the people. This is unknowing or ignorant. They, there's this idea that these things are not outright rebellion. They are things that people didn't realize or weren't thinking right. But Hebrews is saying plainly that the Day of Atonement, you know, the atonement that is achieved by the high priest is only available for the people's unintentional sins. And in Hebrews 10, 26 and 27, he says as well, if we go on sinning deliberately after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a fearful expectation of judgment and a fury of fire that will consume the adversaries. This word for deliberately in Hebrews 10, 26, um, finds its exact opposite in the text of Leviticus as translated in the Septuagint. And uh, to explain that, I guess what I'm, what I'm getting at is I read this in Hebrews 10, and I looked at it and seen, well, yes, that's the word for willing or willingly in uh, Hebrews 10, 26, although this one says deliberately, that's fine. Um, it wasn't until I looked back at Leviticus and I was reading Leviticus, and I decided to look at what does the Greek of Leviticus contain? How did they choose to translate it? Because oftentimes, uh, because the apostles used that translation, oftentimes words that appeared there were carried forward into the New Testament to relate the same things. You know, when the apostles themselves were referring back to the Old Testament, they would use the same words that that translation had used so that there's this clear correspondence for us, you know. And this is one of those places where here he says, if you go on sinning willfully or willingly, it's the opposite of the way that the, the, uh, the Greek translation of Leviticus goes, where it says they do this unwillingly or unwittingly, we might say, accidentally, unintentionally. So, we have to undertake to understand what this is. I think it's an important thing to, to look at, uh, to understand what is being said. And we're going to Leviticus 4 and 5, if you'll turn there with me. And I realize Leviticus is probably not, um, it's probably not the book that your Bible class teachers had you memorize when you were growing up. <laughs> If some of you had people that made you memorize passages of Scripture, I'm pretty sure they were not from Leviticus. But that's all right. We can understand it. The fact is, 
you start reading Leviticus, the first three chapters define what offerings are, what can be offered, how, what is the procedure for that, what do we call this thing? But that's what's happening in those first three chapters. Starting at verse at chapter four, it introduces the topic so that the priests can know the situation at hand. Who is making an offering now? Right, that, that's what's happening. The Leviticus, you know, is called Leviticus because it has to do with Levi, right? The, the priestly work, the work of the priests in the temple. This is their manual. Something that gets lost a lot which I've come to realize recently uh, in translation is that these, you know, these texts were more like manuals. They're more like um, uh, hierarchical organization than narrative, especially Leviticus. So these are topics and categories and subcategories. It's an instruction manual, a uh, flow chart, if you like. <laughs> Um, but when Leviticus gives the instructions about here are the offerings, this is what it means to make an offering. And then it gives the instructions about here is the, the, uh, the scenario. Here is the situation when you will offer this thing. It begins immediately to provide for multiple different scenarios and every one of them is unintentional. When it makes those definitions and it makes those uh, provisions, you know, every subcategory falls under the same heading, which is Leviticus 4, 1 and 2. The Lord spoke to Moses saying, speak to the people of Israel, saying, if anyone sins unintentionally in any of the Lord's commandments about things not to be done and does any one of them, That's the, that's actually, you know, and the way this is translated, you know, here I've got English standard, I'm not trying to knock them, but they're translating this as though it were narrative. That's actually the header, that's the topic. <laughs> Every time a new topic is introduced, it is, and the Lord spoke to Moses saying. That introduces a new section. In this section, the header is, if anyone sins unintentionally in any of the Lord's commandments about things not to be done and does any one of them. A <laughs> little bit wordy, but that's the category. So immediately out of the gate, Leviticus 4 begins with the category of unintentional sins. And that word unintentionally is the opposite of, of the Hebrews 10, 26, deliberately. That's what he's saying. If you go and sin deliberately, we get to the end of the, Levit of the list in Leviticus and there's no offering left. In other words, there's no prescription for that. There's just penalties. Okay, that's what he's getting at. And then I wanted to bring this to you as well, which I've, I've never done, actually. Um, the fact is I've been uh, sometimes uh, well you may know I, I did study Greek and so I will do my own kind of study in Greek um, and the New Testament is written in Greek I will also sometimes refer to the Greek translation of the Old Testament the Septuagint as we mentioned earlier but I know nothing about Hebrew and so for Hebrew I will try to find sources that I think can be objective about this. Um, I do not use seminaries and seminarians because I do not believe that they can be objective. Um, and I have reasons for that. I guess we can talk about it if you want to later. But basically, I found the standard um, Greek grammar manual used in some of the seminaries um, giving absolutely the wrong interpretation of a preposition because of Acts 2.38. They don't want baptism to be into forgiveness of sins. They want it to be because of forgiveness of sins. But that is, you know, you get an F 
in first semester Greek if you don't know what ace means. <laughs> like That's just dishonest. So I don't trust them and I don't use them. But there are other people um, who may have other agendas, but I try to find objective sources and uh, I try to disregard things that they say that are not trustworthy while still grabbing what is potentially useful. All that to say I have been using the Jewish Publication Society's commentary on Leviticus. I've had it for a long time, actually, which is done by Baruch Levine. Um, but again, this is, I don't know Hebrew, so I'm going to use a secular Hebrew scholar to try to get insight from the original language. I do the same with a guy named Robert Alter. Although he's very celebrated, he's from UC Berkeley. Um, he's really celebrated as a New York Times bestseller kind of guy. And he is a vile um, mocker. He is a vile mocker. But he has some pretty sharp Hebrew linguistic analysis. So I will dismiss his theories about aliens coming to earth and forming the sons of God in Genesis. While listening to what he says about this particle gets used here, 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 and in the story of Samuel, and you can see how these are tied together. I'll use that. Same thing here, JPS commentaries. Obviously, the modern Jewish Publication Society and I do not agree about a whole lot of things. But these comments are quite good. And I thought it was important to see that, hey, they're kind of primer. They're kind of, you know, if you're being brought up in the Jewish tradition, you're hearing this from a young age. He says, it should be emphasized here, which is at the very beginning, <laughs> first thing in this book, should be emphasized here as the workings of the sacrificial system are introduced to the reader that the laws of the Torah do not permit Israelites to expiate intentional or premeditated offenses by means of sacrifice. Expiate means get forgiven, get washed away. The laws of the Torah did not permit Israelites to expiate intentional or premeditated offenses by means of sacrifice. There was no vicarious ritual remedy. Vicarious ritual remedy is referring to sacrifice, the substitution of your property or your wealth. That's what offering a, a sheep or paying a fine is. There is no vicarious ritual remedy for such violations, whether they were perpetrated against other individuals or against God himself. So at the very beginning, he wants to lay it out plainly that Leviticus has no provision for intentional or premeditated offenses. There's no sacrifice for that, which is exactly what Hebrews 10, 26 is saying. The other thing um, that he said, which I thought was very interesting, the mistaken notion that ritual worship could atone for criminality or intentional religious desecration was persistently attacked by the prophets of Israel who considered it a major threat to the entire covenantal relationship between Israel and God. Yeah, that's right. Whether they would remain his people was in jeopardy if they thought that ritual worship could atone for criminality or intentional religious desecration, as in, if you thought you could knowingly do wrong and then just pay a fine or offer a sacrifice and say you're sorry, that was very dangerous in the eyes of the prophets. And he's right. That's true. It's a good observation. Jeremiah talks about it. Isaiah talks about it. I mean, it, it's everywhere. He's right about this. That's true. But he's calling out that it's a mistaken notion. They thought this and they were rebuked for it. I don't want you to leave my commentary thinking anything else. You know, he's very concerned that you get the right idea, which I found interesting. But um, those are his general comments. Now on the text itself, here in Leviticus 4, on verse 2, where it says, if anyone sins unintentionally, what Levine tells me about that in his commentary is that the Hebrew verb indicates one of two things. It means either they didn't know that it was illegal to do the thing that they were doing, or 
they thought the thing they were doing was okay by mistake. So in the first case, you know, they didn't know it was illegal to do it. Well, that's just they didn't know they were not aware that this act was in violation of the law. They hadn't heard that or they hadn't realized that or whatever it was. They didn't understand this was a mistake. They shouldn't be doing this. That's inadvertence. On the other thing, it would be the example he gave was like if you eat the forbidden fat that was set aside by the offering for the priest or for the Lord to be burnt on the, off, on the altar. If you ate that forbidden fat by mistake, thinking that it was the portion of fat you were allowed to eat, that's the kind of thing that these offenses that are covered, where somebody either didn't realize that the thing they were doing had actually been forbidden, or they thought what they were doing was clean, one of the clean things, even though they knew that there were some that weren't, right? What he's getting at is, in both cases, the presumption is that an Israelite possessed of full awareness and knowledge would seek to obey God's laws, not violate them. That's the meaning of this. That this unwittingly commits an offense is their rendering of sins unintentionally. Leviticus 4, verse 2. So the presumption is that an Israelite who has the full awareness and knowledge of what they're doing, not aware of what this is and aware of what the law teaches about this thing, that that person would not try to break God's law. That's the assumption of Leviticus, is that you are trying to do what is right. Leviticus is made for people of faith. In other words, he's not saying that, I'm saying that based on his commentary on, on the Hebrew language. It's made for people of faith. There's not a provision for people who hear what God says and say, eh, I don't care, I'm going to do what I want. It doesn't talk to you then. Why should it? <laughs> that makes sense. <laughs> Is there some reason for God to go on talking after you've said, I don't care what you say? <laughs> don't make no sense. So if you keep looking at Leviticus 4, you know, the fact that unintentional sins is the category can be established by looking at the following verses. At verse 3, the subcategory is introduced if it is the, high, the anointed priest who sins, thus bringing guilt on the people. At verse 13, if the whole congregation of Israel sins unintentionally, and the, uh, well, I'm going to skip a little bit there. And in the 22nd verse, when a leader sins, doing unintentionally any one of the things, etc. And the 27th verse, if any one of the common people sins unintentionally and doing any one of the things, etc. These are all subcategories under the major category, which is Leviticus 4.2. If anyone sins unintentionally in any one of the Lord's commandments about things not to be done and does any one of them. That's what we're talking about. These are the situations. So in that third verse of Leviticus 4, if it's the anointed priest who sins, bringing, thus bringing guilt on the people, then he shall do the following, and it goes on for the, for the next 10 verses. The anointed priest is susceptible to sin. The anointed priest is the high priest. He's the one that has oil on him. The anointed priest is susceptible to sin. He's the representative of the people, you know. Before God, they all worship God through the high priest. When he sins, it brings guilt on the people whom he represents. And the people, therefore, may suffer the consequences of the high priest's sin. Anyone remember Eli? And others. The people suffer some bad things if the high priest is not faithful. Down in Leviticus 4.13, if the whole congregation of Israel sins unintentionally, and this one goes on for a bit. And the thing is hidden from the eyes of the assembly. And they do... Sorry, ungraceful page turn. And they do any one of the things that by the Lord's commandments ought not to be done. And they realize their guilt when the sin which they have committed becomes known. Then this is what they shall do. So that's the subcategory. But it says the whole congregation could sin. 
that's telling me the whole congregation could be wrong. Now, again, the, the lesson of this is for us to think about it, that just because we all agree doesn't mean that it's so. We need to have book, chapter, and verse. We've got to refer back to the text of the Bible and see, is that in here? Is that what it says? And we have to be willing to accept it when the Bible convicts us of being wrong about something. I got no problem with that. I'm not afraid of that. What you ought to be afraid of is not accepting such a thing. I believe what I believe. Let the Bible say whatever it wants to. No, that's not good. You need to be willing to listen to God. The whole congregation could be wrong. It could be hidden from the eyes of the assembly. Yeah, that could happen to where people nobody sees it clearly. They might do one of the things forbidden, it says. Any one thing is enough, as James said. Whoever transgresses one point of the law is guilty of all. That's the meaning of it. Any one thing among the commandments is enough to be a problem. It says they come to realize their guilt when the sin which they have committed becomes known. Those are alternatives. Either they themselves come to realize they were wrong at some point, which I say is by God's mercy, thanks be to God, if he allows us to realize our mistakes, or the sin which they committed becomes known. In other words, somebody manages to point it out. And we hear that somebody, which we need. We need that. We need people who are faithful, who will stand up and say, you know, brethren, we need to consider this thing. I'm not seeing this in the Bible. We need that. Uh, you go down to the leader in verse 22. When a leader sins, doing unintentionally any one of the things that by the commandments uh, of the Lord his God ought not to be done and realizes his guilt or the sin which he has committed is made known to him. Right, so this is very similar to what happened with the people, but this is a leader who is not necessarily of the priestly class, right? This is any kind of leader of the people. Any leader could also be wrong, is what we're getting at. A person who is esteemed, a person who is a teacher or who is a leader among the people, they could be wrong. I could be wrong. I readily admit that. I could be wrong. I've been wrong before. And just like it was said about the whole congregation and about the high priest doing any one of all the things by the commandments, the Lord ought not be done. Any one thing is enough to bring guilt. This one is plain in differentiating realizes his guilt or the sin which he's committed is made known to him. It is to say he either is honest enough that he comes to realize it either on further hearing or reading of the law or someone manages to point it out to him successfully. But again, that's a test of my character. Am I willing to hear feedback? Am I willing to hear criticism? Am I willing to accept that I might be wrong? I have to be. The Bible is always right. God is above question. But I'm just a man. <laughs> I'm just your fellow human being, right? We have to be willing to do that. In the 27th verse, if any one of the common people sins unintentionally in doing any one of the things that by the Lord's commandments ought not to be done and realizes his guilt or the sin which he's committed is made known to him, then he shall do the following, right? But notice it's the same as with the leader. How we identify the guilt, it's exactly the same. He sins unintentionally, doing any one of the things that God said should not be done. He realizes his guilt or his sin is made known to him by somebody else. It's exactly the same. The difference is in what they offer. The leader is required to offer a male goat. The commoner is to offer a female, and it can be either a goat or a lamb. 
That's the difference between these offerings, which is interesting to me because it's that it is a reference, I think, to Adam and Eve and the leadership versus the follower. The leader of the people bears that male responsibility that Adam must take on as a consequence of his open rebellion. The person who is in following, who is the weaker vessel, in the position of following a leader is bringing the female offering. But however you look at that, this basically gets to anybody. It could be the high priest, it could be the whole congregation, it could be a leader of the congregation, it could be a member of the congregation. Anybody is subject to the same thing. And I point out, hastily at the end of the fifth chapter there's one that they you know Levine in the in the JPS commentary calls it a contingency as in this is a, this is one where there's uncertainty about whether they have committed the sin or not and uh, he mentions Job where Job offers you know, makes offerings on behalf of his sons and daughters in case they have cursed God. In Job 1, verse 5. Maybe that's true, maybe that's not true. But what I think is true and is important is how this closes out the discussion of these offerings by saying, yeah, if anyone sins doing any one of these things, though he did not know it, then realizes his guilt, he shall bear his iniquity. He shall bring to the priest a ram without blemish out of the flock or its equivalent for a guilt offering. The priest shall make atonement for him for the mistake that he made unintentionally and he shall be forgiven. It is a guilt offering. He has indeed incurred guilt before the Lord. I think that it's a perfect coda. It is saying even the possibility of having done wrong, <laughs> which is more than the realization after the fact that you did wrong. right? But even that possibility says it is a guilt offering he has indeed incurred guilt before the lord the fact is uh, as the commentary said on and they realize their guilt guilt exists whether or not the offender is aware of it at the time god's wrath is aroused by the offense against him even before the offender realizes what he has done that's their reading and this is actually i'm i've really pared it down for you here <laughs> This is a very lengthy discussion of, uh, of the, the order of tenses, the positive versus the negative formulation of the, the legal structure of law code. It's a very lengthy thing, but what it comes down to is this. They're saying the meaning of it is this. The guilt exists whether the offender's aware of it or not because they have offended God the moment that they did it. And it's what Leviticus said. It's a guilt offering. He has indeed incurred guilt before the Lord. It's important to understand that Eve was honest, but even so, even though, and she was deceived, but even so, it was still sin. And she was still guilty and held responsible for that. And we will be too. That's why it's so important for us to avoid it. Now, Numbers 35 is the other thing that Levine points out that I have to agree. He's right about this. So I bring it to your attention. Numbers makes a distinction between intentional and unintentional sins in chapter 35, verses 9 to 34. This is the place where the cities of refuge are defined and outlined and regulated. And he's talking about the city of refuge is the place where somebody flees when they kill another person. And this whole this is a lengthy discussion, and I don't intend to read every verse, but but to point out the things that need to be pointed out. In the discussion of somebody kills another person and they have cities of refuge where they go, that is to say, there's a 
There needs to be time passing during which judgment can be made about what has happened. That's all that's being said. In this discussion, there is a clear distinction between an accidental death and a murder. One of these is unintentional. The other of these is deliberate. You find there in Numbers 35, verses 11 and 12, Select cities to be cities of refuge for you, that the manslayer who kills any person without intent may flee there. The, the cities will be for you a refuge from the avenger, that the manslayer may not die until he stands before the congregation for judgment. It's very plain. But the first thing is the manslayer who kills any person without intent can flee to the city of refuge and will be preserved alive until judgment can be rendered. The manslayer who kills any person without intent, that's fairly clear. That's an accidental death. However, in the 15th verse, he said, uh, these six cities will be refuge for the people of Israel, for the stranger, the sojourner among them too. Anyone who kills any person without intent may flee to these six cities. But, verse 16, if he struck him down with an iron object so that he died, he is a murderer. The murderer shall be put to death. And if he struck him down with a stone tool that could cause death and he died, he is a murderer. The murderer shall be put to death. Or if he struck him down with a wooden tool that could cause death and he dies, or he died, he is a murderer. The murderer shall be put to death. Verse 20 said, if he pushed him or out, uh, if he pushed him out of hatred or hurled something at him lying in wait so that he died or in enmity struck him down with his hand so that he died then he who struck the blow shall be put to death he is a murderer so there's an accidental thing and there is an intentional thing and what he's saying is the city of refuge is for the person who did this by accident. And it's true, there are accidents. You work in a construction site and, and you drop some load from a height and somebody down there dies. Well, did you know there was somebody down there? Did you have an argument with that person, some reason to take him out? Or was this really you didn't know, you didn't see them? You know, that's the difference. But what he says is, then the person who did this shall be put to death. He is a murderer. Every time with an iron implement, with a, a tool that can be used to kill somebody, with their own hands. Every time when they did this, and it's out of hatred, it's out of enmity, they had a, an argument, they had a fight, that person is considered a murderer. And that has no refuge, no time, no hanging around in the city. That person gets put to death. For if we go on sinning deliberately after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a fearful expectation of judgment and a fury of fire that will consume the adversaries. That's what's intended. They find out, they determine, no, he meant to kill that guy. Then he gets put to death. There was no jail in ancient Israel, you know. They didn't have incarceration. If you were found guilty of murder, they put you to death. That was the law. Compare that same scenario again in verse 22 to 25. But if he pushed him suddenly without enmity or hurled anything on him without lying in wait, used a stone that could cause death, but without seeing him, dropped it on him so that he died, though he was not his enemy and didn't seek his harm. Well, then the, the congregation should judge between the congregation shall judge between the manslayer and the avenger of blood in accordance with these rules. The congregation shall rescue the manslayer from the hand of the avenger of blood and restore him to his city of refuge to which he had fled. He shall live in it until the death of the high priest who was anointed with the holy oil. The congregation 
is to rescue the manslayer from the hand of the avenger of blood. It's interesting because it's saying the one who did this accidentally still has a price to pay because he loses his freedom. He has to go to the city of refuge. But there is protection. God has provided a protection. And it's 1 John 2 and 1, Little children, I write this to you that you may not sin, but if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. God has protection for accidents. When we come to our senses and we come back to God, we can be forgiven. There is refuge. That doesn't mean there won't be consequences, but he makes provision for us to be forgiven, that we can come back. On the other hand, these things that it said in 31 to 34 of Numbers 35, I found to be very compelling. Moreover, you shall accept no ransom for the life of a murderer who is guilty of death, but he shall be put to death. You shall, know, you shall accept no ransom for him who has fled to the city of refuge, that he may return to dwell in the land before the death of the high priest. No money can buy them out of this, is what he's saying. There's no price you can pay that will make up for open rebellion. Why? Because, 33, you shall not pollute the land in which you live, for the blood pollutes the land, and no atonement can be made for the land for the blood that is shed in it, except by the blood of the one who shed it. You shall not defile the land in which you live, in the midst of which I dwell, for I, the Lord, dwell in the midst of the people of Israel. Do not pollute the land in which you live. Blood pollutes it. So the shedding of blood inside the city of God is pollution. We cannot accept any ransom to get out of that. We can have no fellowship with sin. That's what that means. We can have no fellowship with sin. No atonement can be made for the land for the blood shed in it except by the blood of the one who shed it. Sin leads to death. There's no reckoning. There's nothing we can do to save ourselves from the consequences of our sins. We need the grace of God to be forgiven. And in 1 John 1, 7, he said, If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus cleanses us from all sin. It's Jesus who died, who shed his blood that we can be forgiven. He is the way that we can obtain forgiveness of our sins when we come to our senses and come back to God. But you see, the price under the law of Moses for murder was such that there was nothing, no offering, no money. Nothing could be done. If you committed murder, the only thing is to put that person to death. That's it. We have a better law, a better covenant under better promises with a better sacrifice. But the principle stands. We can have no fellowship with sin. Sin leads to death. There is not a remedy other than to be right with the Lord, to repent. And yes, as we looked at this morning, I'll draw our attention again to the opening chapters of 1 John briefly. He said what we need to know. In 1 John 1, verse 9, he said, If we confess our sins, God is faithful and God is just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Eve honestly confessed, The serpent deceived me and I ate. She realized after the fact that it was wrong. We must confess. And if we do, we can trust God that he will forgive and he has the right to do so because he has already given the life of his own son. Again, chapter 2 and verse 1, we referred to earlier. The purpose of this is that we may not sin. But if anybody does sin, we have an advocate. We're not supposed to engage in intentional sin. 
any more than they were under Levitical code, any more than what Hebrews 10, 26, and 27 tell us. We can't go on sinning deliberately after receiving knowledge of truth. You've got to desist, cease and desist, and come back to God if you want to have a chance of life. Otherwise, you lose your soul. And again in 1 John chapter 2, it's verse 4 that says, Whoever says, I know him, but doesn't keep his commandments is a liar. The truth is not in this one. But whoever keeps his word, verse 5, in him truly the love of God is perfected. We bring to maturity our love for God by means of our obedience to his commandments. If I love God, I keep his word. I will make mistakes. I will be wrong sometime. But God has made provision for that too, in his mercy and in his grace, because he loves us. And because he is good, he's gracious and allows us to come to our senses. It's very gracious of him that we don't die the moment that we do wrong. There wouldn't be anybody standing. <laughs> but we must press on to maturity. All right. So that's how that works out. And I hope that those things are useful because they're really unlocking for us the mechanism of deception. It's how we can be deceived, how we can fall into doing something that is actually sinful. But remember that our God is gracious and he will allow us to repent sometimes. Um, there might come a time when that's not the case. There are people who die doing evil. And we don't say that you pray about this, as John tells it. Today, are you a Christian? Have you become a child of God? Our plea today is Jesus Christ the righteous. If you believe that God is right and you have been wrong, if you believe that Jesus is his son, put him on in baptism for forgiveness of sins, becoming a child of God, pledging your life to him from now on. We have water prepared that you may do so. Are you a Christian who hasn't lived right? Repent. Pray God for forgiveness. Let each of us be honest and open and willing to hear through the word of God what it is that we need to be right with him. I, I don't have to be right, you know. I, I have to do what God wants. What I want is to die right. I, I want to finish having done what God wants me to do. I, I don't have to, you know, I don't have to be perfect. I don't have to get everything right. I could be wrong. I, I can have it pointed out by anybody. <laughs> Just get me into heaven. I want to be saved. That's what we need. If you need the prayers of the saints, if you need to be baptized, let your need be known by coming to the front while we stand and sing the song selected.